Welcome to another International Relations Capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. Today, the topic we have chosen is recent trends in geopolitics. We have been discussing in the last few months the various developments that have been taking place all around the world, from country to country, region to region. What we are trying to do today is to look at this whole scene, the international scene, and see whether we can identify certain trends which have a bearing on the future, on the future of the world, on the future of various countries, and particularly to India. In other words, what are the contours of, or the shape of the post-pandemic world as it has emerged till now? That is the purpose of this. When the pandemic broke out, people started making predictions about the future. Two predictions struck me most. Henry Kissinger said that the world is going to be entirely different from what it was in 2019. The world of the post-pandemic world will be beyond recognition. Another American intellectual, Richard Haas, also a Republican, said that no, what we will see will be an acceleration of the trends which are already in history. The pandemic will accelerate them and things may change, but there will still be some continuity in international relations. So what we are seeing in the last three years or so is more towards the direction of Mr. Haas's prophecy. Many of the trends that we were actually seeing in the world have picked up speed and many things have moved much faster than it would have without the pandemic. Of course, we still do not have an exact idea as to what the world would be. But we can pick up a few things which indicate that humanity is a particularly determined species, and we do not change very much. We remain within the sphere that we are familiar with and adjust ourselves to the new situation. There is already a feeling that normalcy is going to return, or in other words, the new norms, the new norm may not be altogether different from the old, but with the characteristics of the a new situation that is emerging after the pandemic has uh, dealt with the world. One of the major concerns was what the demographic composition of the world would be as a result of the millions of people have, who have perished and also the equations among, among countries of the world. To make a quick uh, recounting of what happened, you will remember that the first casualty of the pandemic was the collapse of the multilateral system. Normally, the United Nations should have risen to the occasion, like it did in the case of previous epidemics and pandemics, to work as one UN in order to deal with it, with a global uh, structure with international cooperation. But because of the trends which were set in by the United States to undermine the international system by President Trump particularly. The pandemic expedited the collapse of the multilateral system. The United Nations Security Council could not even meet what to speak of taking collaborative action. So what we saw was a situation where the countries were taking care of themselves. There was no organized plan to combat the pandemic. And everyone was left to himself or herself to deal with it. And very solid regional cooperation bodies like the EU, etc., did not function. So we saw that the most powerful countries in the world, the most advanced countries in the world, suffered more than the poorer countries, which did not have access to the rest of the world. 
So this was the first casualty. And the United Nations could not do anything. It was all left to the WHO, which is only a specialized agency of the United Nations. Of course, they did their best, but they are a scientific organization and not a uh, political organization. And so the response of the United Nations towards the pandemic and also the regional organizations was quite weak and ineffective. Efforts were made to revive some of them, like India tried to revive SARC. G20 was summoned. G1, G7 was summoned. And none of those organizations could do anything much, except for some kind of pledges of helping each other. So not only the fight against the pandemic becoming, became fractured, uh, but also the whole approach to international community got fractured as groups started functioning, or the country started functioning outside the groups. Of course, new groups were formed in certain ways. The groups were meeting occasionally, particularly since face-to-face -face meeting was not possible. The interaction was not very effective. But we saw the beginnings of a new cooperation and collaboration after the first two years or so. That was a major change. Then the retreat of the United States from the center of the world. Though it was not a deliberate withdrawal, but the compulsions of domestic policy, the change of government in the United States, etc., compelled the United States not to be as active in international politics as it used to be. Because President Trump said Trump himself had withdrawn from the international arena. You know, he was not very much with the European Union. And therefore, there was some kind of isolation by the US. But that increased because of their problems, the, the immense problems that, the health problems that uh, uh, United States faced. And this gave the impression to China that this was their opportunity to accelerate their own pace of overtaking the United States. So everyone had predicted that in the next 14, 15, 20 years, China would be ahead of the United States. But the pandemic gave them the impression that they could move even further and faster and take over the leadership of the United States. Therefore, we found them active in Ladakh, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in South China Sea, etc. So this was a big push that uh, China made. And the other setback to the United States was the developments in Afghanistan because of the sudden withdrawal of the United States and their total inability to control the situation in Afghanistan, into which China, Russia, Pakistan, and Iran began stepping in. And the United States got isolated there. And countries like India also got into difficulties because of our relationship with the Taliban has been poor right from the beginning. And therefore, another area of divergence came and new groupings started coming. And uh, India was virtually isolated in the whole situation. And we were trying to build new bridges, meeting people, friends and foes alike, in order to build a new arrangement to deal with Afghanistan. And that is still in a formative stage. We cannot say that we have succeeded. But at least the Taliban government has not been recognized by any state and only humanitarian assistance is being given. And maybe over a period of time, Taliban will learn its lessons and uh, uh, try to get international recognition. Then the re-emergence of America to take back its position in the world began appearing. And um, Mr. Biden tried to build his bridges with the European Union and Western Europe in general. And he became slightly softer towards China than President Trump. So President Biden started thinking in terms of two rivals, not just China, but also Russia. Earlier, the thinking was that what would emerge would be a cold war between US and China. 
and other countries will be in the periphery. But as a result of this shift, what has happened is the focus of the United States came on to Russia rather than to China. And there was this Geneva meeting of the two leaders. They tried to find an equation. But what happened was they moved further away from each other. And therefore, Russia began wondering whether they would be secure if the United States actively promotes European Union and NATO expansion into the, towards the East. So you know, Russia on the other hand, not China, but Russia started flexing its muscles and it began, began amassing troops on the Ukraine border. Of course, since 2014, there have been problems between Russia and Ukraine. Crimea was annexed by them. The world criticized, but they still stayed. So encouraged by those developments, Russia being threatened by NATO and the United States began taking action, which has caused complete considerable concern in the world. So thousands of troops were amassed on the border of Russia and Ukraine. And also troops were sent to Belorussia, which is on the other side of Ukraine. And a situation was created that there was a threat of war. Even now, that has not receded. Many people still think that there will be a war in Ukraine. And many nationalities have been withdrawn from Ukraine. And embassies are started moving out, etc. So a war hysteria has been created. Russia continues to say that they have no intention to invade. And their purpose is merely to make sure that NATO does not expand into the former Soviet republics. So in other words, countries like Ukraine, Belarus, etc. should not be dragged into, the, into NATO, making it difficult for Russia to survive as a nation. But behind that is the dream of President Putin to restore the glamour and glory of Soviet Union as Russia itself, because his, his own dreams about the resurrection of the Soviet Union, maybe not in form, but at least uh, in spirit. So the objective of the uh, Russia, according to themselves, is to get security guarantees from NATO, Europe, and the United States that their flanks, like Ukraine, etc., will not be overtaken by NATO. So that seems like a legitimate aspiration on the part of Russia. But it has met with great resistance by the United States and Europe. Of course, there are some differences between Europe and United States. France, Germany, etc., are not as um, harsh towards Russia as the United States is, because they have a stake in it because Russian oil, gas, etc., are being used in Europe. And if there is a war, the immediate reaction would be the cutting off of energy supplies to Europe, which is not very welcome to European countries. And therefore, they would like to avoid a war. US also does not talk about a war. It talks about very severe economic sanctions if Russia moved towards Ukraine. So in my view, there is no justification for a war. There is no logic for a war. Because it is not difficult for the Western countries to concede that Ukraine will not be taken into NATO in the near future. And in return for it, Russia could withdraw its troops and we could bring back peace and stability to Europe. So that possibility still exists. But then logic does not always apply in such cases. And a thoughtless action by someone like President Putin could probably cause, cause a conflict. But there is no need for it because there is a solution in sight and depends on uh, what kind of guarantees the US and Europe can give so that Russia does not have to take any precipitate action. So into this situation came up the Winter Olympics in Beijing. The Winter Olympics became a point of contention because the United States, UK, Australia, Japan, not the whole of European Union, boycotted the Winter Olympics, saying, 
criticizing the Chinese action against the Uyghurs in China, the uh, Islamic minority in China. So using that as a human rights argument, they decided to boycott the Olympics, Winter Olympics. So that brought in a divide between the, within the world, two groups, those who go to the Winter Olympics and those who don't go. Where was India? We decided to decided not to boycott the Olympics. In fact, there is one alpine skier who was participating in the Olympics from Kashmir. But unfortunately, on the inaugural day, since the Chinese used a Chinese soldier who fought the battle with India uh, in Galvan Valley, was picked up as the torch bearer of the Olympic torch at the inaugural ceremony, which forced India to boycott the inaugural. So we are participating in the sports, but we boycotted the. So in effect, we also became a nation which boycotted. But on the other hand, there were countries like Russia, Pakistan, obviously, Iran, and some of the uh, Central Asian republics all participated. So the Winter Olympics provided an opportunity for a regrouping of the nations. And the major outcome of it was the emergence of a new friendship between Russia and China. This is a very significant development because though they have been getting closer as a result of uh, the strengthening of uh, US and President Trump's activities, etc. But they were not so close as before. They, not, they were not close before. And now they have become much closer as a result of the summit meeting which was held in Beijing just before the Olympics. The joint statement between President Putin and President Xi is most significant in this respect because they are declaring, declaring eternal friendship to each other and declaring themselves as strategic partners, causing a big difference in the situation before the pandemic. So this has major implication. This was the first face-to-face -face meeting between Putin and Xi after the pandemic started almost two years. And when they came together at the Olympics, it was seen as some kind of a axis of authoritarian states. Because on the one hand, you had the democratic states, which are boycotting the Olympics, and the authoritarian states like um, Russia, China, and also to a certain extent, Pakistan and Iran, etc. on the other side. So a new partnership has developed and a new kind of division has happened. So it's not going to be a Cold War between US and China, but a Cold War in, say, in, in a three-dimensional Cold War is... Uh, emerging. Of course, Chinese economic support is very important for Russia. And they concluded, even in the middle of all this happening, they concluded a 30-year energy deal, according to which Russia would deliver natural gas to China for the next uh, 30 years. And China has supported the, for the Russian demand for security guarantees. In other words, strengthening the Russian position that they have somebody strongly supporting the Russian position that unless there is a guarantee about the NATO expansion, Russia cannot let the Ukraine situation develop. So in a sense, Russia is not isolated anymore on this question of Ukraine. And in return for that, Russia has expressed support for Taiwan. This is also new because Russia, like all of us, have a one China policy and none of us recognizes Taiwan as an independent state, though we all have relations with them. But exactly 50 years after the Nixon visit in 1972, in 2022, we saw the sign of China shaking hands with Russia rather than the United States and getting support for the most crucial, the core issue for China, which is Taiwan. And so Russia is now committed to 
Taiwan. And so the new axis, as I mentioned, has developed at the Winter Olympics in Beijing. And close at hand were these two other countries, Pakistan and Iran. Pakistan, of course, is looking for finance, support, political support, anti anti India propaganda, etc. And so Pakistan has always been an evergreen friend of China for no reason except that their hatred for India, which China shares. And so Pakistan is a ready-made partner in this, though Pakistan is very much involved with the United States. They don't mind shifting loyalties around, and their loyalty is more to China than to the United States. And Iran, not a full participant in this, but their hatred for the United States and the possibility of the Vienna talks failing, because in Vienna, the nuclear talks between the United States, other uh, European partners, and Iran have been taking place, but the sign signals from there is that it is not likely to succeed. So China is, uh, Iran is facing a big threat from the United States. If these, talk, if these talks fail, the sanctions will be intensified and Iran will be pushed into developing its nuclear capabilities against the wish of the United States and Europe. So there is a confrontation emerging there. And there also, Iran would like to get China's support. And already they have agreed on to a long-term economic relationship. So what we are seeing is, as against the Quad, at the US, India, Australia, Japan, now you have a new Quad. You can probably call it the Chinese Quad, with China, Russia, Iran, and Pakistan. And this is an absolutely new development. And they are talking about a new chapter in Russia-China relations, coordination Asian affairs. And therefore, Russia is not isolated on uh, Ukraine. And China is not isolated on Taiwan. It suits both of them. So people say that this is the development of a personal relationship between President Putin and President Xi also. They have been developing a kind of personal relationship, but it is more than that because uh, they have found common cause in being together in this difficult situation. And uh, the, this has upset the world, the balance in the world. And the United States will now be forced to take more and more anti Chinese, anti Russian positions. So it may even provoke the Americans to impose sanctions against Russia, even if there is no war in Ukraine. So the situation has become more explosive. And one consequence of this will be that India will get closer to the United States because our relationship with Russia is very strong. We have a long, old military relationship. We are buying sophisticated weapons. Even about 60% of our weapons come from Russia. We have a a political relationship. President Putin was in Delhi when he even promised that he will try to resolve the problem between India and China. And he even talked about the possibility of a summit between Russia, India, and China. But all these have now disappeared in a sense. Because by becoming an ally of China, now their flexibility to act in favor of India or in favor of peace between India and China, is now become remote. So these are just conclusions that we are drawing from what we have happened. So, so we will get closer to the United States. Uh, we might strengthen our uh, relationship in the Quad. Of course, in Quad, there are other indications, which I'll come to a little later. But the immediate result will be our getting closer to the US. And then US imposing conditions on our relationship with Russia. They have not discouraged India's military collaboration with Russia because they think that that will help India to counter China. So otherwise they would not have allowed, they could not have allowed us to buy S-400 missiles. They could have sanctioned us. But they didn't do that because any strengthening of the military strength of India would be useful for India to counter China. 
But now that there is a confrontation with China and Russia, then the Americans may become more tough on India's military collaboration with Russia, which will mean that Russia's relations with India will be affected. So that is the implications uh, for us. So the hope that Russia would be helpful in resolving India-China problems and to uh, be a kind of friend of India, which has always been, to reduce problems for India. Russia has now joined the opposite camp. And um, when we are actually thinking in terms of uh, getting closer to the United States or inevitable, when it becomes inevitable for us to get closer to the United States, we are not very sure about the US position on China. Biden is still awaiting the solution of a problem in Europe before he even starts a strategy towards China. At the moment, of course, it is confrontationist. But he is not conceding that China is an enemy number one for him. So he thinks that there is need for cooperation with China. So at that time, when we are becoming a part of uh, the, the anti-China, anti-Russia grouping, then we will be compelled to accept our uh, closeness to the Quad and we will have to accept the Quad becoming a more of a military group. And the most recent development is also we must take into account. There was a meeting of Quad foreign ministers in Melbourne Many of you may have seen today's editorial in the Hindi, which is very significant. So pointing out that Quad, instead of becoming an organization against China, the Quad is now becoming a positive force for something else. So it is not a negative posture that Quad took in Melbourne. They were talking about, of course, about uh, cross-border terrorism and uh, open, uh, open Indo-Pacific, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the but the sting against China was lacking, and also there was not entire unanimity about the situation in the world. Quad has differences of opinion. They have also been revealed, like for instance in the in the case of Ukraine. India's position is certainly different from that of the United States. And that is known, we even abstained on the Security Council resolution because we did not want to uh, abandon Russia in this context. And we have not made any, any strong statements about Russia. We have concerns. We have Indian nationals in Ukraine. We have not withdrawn them because we still believe that things will be settled. And on an assurance, obviously, from the Russians, we have not moved to that extent of withdrawing our people, withdrawing the MBC, all this we have not done. So that means there is a certain understanding between India and Russia on what is going to happen in Ukraine. And therefore, the Quad did not speak about any, the situation in uh, Ukraine, possibly because of uh, India's situation and India's vote in the Security Council. So a, a slight variation of approach within the Quad. So what the court has done is we are now, they are now talking about uh, um, you know vaccines, strengthening vaccine cooperation, strengthening climate change cooperation. In other words, now that AUKUS is in place, uh, Quad is losing some of its military uh, sting or military uh, arm and going more for constructive, positive cooperation. That is why the Hindu called it for something and not against something. It was against China right from the beginning. But there is a slight erosion in that also as a result of all this. Even on Myanmar, for example, India has a different perspective than the US. India is against the imposition of sanctions by countries, even though we accept that the, the Burmese or the Myanmarese military is crossing all limits by oppressing the people and not uh, even cooperating with ASEAN, 
which is trying to bring about some kind of compromise. So we are certainly not approve of the military actions, but we are not joining the West in opposing Myanmar because we are afraid that if we do that, Myanmar will go even more into the arms of the Chinese. Of course, there is nothing more to do. They are already virtually like a part of China for all practical purposes. But we don't want Myanmar to be completely swallowed by China, which virtually it has been. But we want some amount of flexibility on this because we have this long border with Myanmar. There is a lot of complication on those borders and we need the support of the Myanmarese army in order to solve our own problems on the border. And therefore, we want to maintain a certain relationship, though we want democracy to be restored. So our foreign minister said in Melbourne, we want uh, democracy to be restored in uh, Burma, but we are not going to gang up against uh, with the rest of the world uh, to oppose the Myanmarese regime. So Indian position, as I said, was also on the side was softer. And um, we did not vote for the resolution and we did not join in the uh, evacuation exercise. So Quad is also becoming a softer alliance. But of course, US is aware of the existence of AUKUS, which is a military alliance and which is targeted against China. And uh, the other element of uh, cooperation between US, between Russia and China is the word Indo-Pacific. Because it was the US which changed the name Asia-Pacific to Indo-Pacific. Because they started moving more and more US troops into the Indian Ocean region. And they, changed, they gave the name of their command in that area as Indo-Pacific Command. And that was considered to be a favor for India because the word India comes in. But I don't know whether it was intended. But we were very pleased and we accepted it. And we keep talking about Indo-Pacific. But Russia has specifically objected to the name Indo-Pacific. Because the word Indo-Pacific seems to suggest that whatever is happening in Indo-Pacific is directed against China. So Russia's new relationship with China has made them nervous even about the name Indo-Pacific. And obviously, both of them see Quad as a threat to both Russia and China. So we are in a situation now. We have several challenges. India has several ch challenges in the new situation. And uh, this is not going to change dramatically. Of course, we are all looking at Ukraine. We are looking at Taiwan. What are, the, what are going to happen there? But clearly, this new combination of Russia and China as a major force on the international scene is a new development. And this has implications for the United States, for Europe, for the rest of the world, and particularly India. So this is what I wanted to bring your attention to and to start studying this phenomenon, not only for the sake of the examination, but also to understand the world, we need to see the regrouping that is taking place after the pandemic, because the pandemic is not over yet. But these are the signs that we should look for and follow these developments to see what the post-pandemic world will look like. Thank you. Uh, I'm not a, an astrologer to predict the future, uh, but USA may not concede everything that Russia is asking for. But it may not be difficult for the, for the United States to concede one point, that Ukraine need not join the NATO now. And there's nothing dramatic they're going to achieve. So if that gives some comforts to Russia, and Russia does not build upon it to make even greater demands or to <laughs> occupy parts of Ukraine, then that would be a dangerous situation. But uh, my feeling is that there is scope for an understanding at this stage. This will be a big change because um, 
there has been a certain arranged understanding because the most important uh, uh, event of that time was the Bangladesh war, where we virtually, you know, uh, fought the war with the assistance of the Soviet Union. So that in the neighborhood, it has been helpful to us. And, um, and our security is at the moment very much dependent on Russia. So let us hope that this will not dramatically change that. But it will certainly change, affect our relations with Russia. I have no doubt about that. Because Russia was some kind of a, what shall we say, a buffer between India um, and, uh, you know, and China. And now, if they are going to join China and say that um, China is their first priority in Asia, that will have some serious implications for us. That we don't need uh, China. We already have Afghanistan and Taliban to create more confusion in Kashmir. And if they, if Pakistan is working with China, then naturally there will be more uh, terrorism in India, in Kashmir, and it will have its own implications. Because I am confident that it will be averted. I do not expect a war there. But what the conditions would be, whether the UK model, etc., will be available, I don't know. But I don't think the West or United States is still ready to have a formal 30-year arrangement. That much of a commitment they are not willing to make. And that is the reason why Russia has not withdrawn its forces. Because what they want is ironclad guarantees. And uh, to give that guarantee at this time will look like a surrender on the part of NATO. That is, if somebody is uh, cyber rattling, and then you obey their instructions. And that will not be very good for them to uh, have. And so that, that is a battle going on. The battle of wits going on is on that account. What will be the nature of the guarantee? Will that guarantee be satisfactory to Russia or not? And that will come up in the next few days. And that will further consolidate whatever is the global situation. As you know, the global situation is in a flux. Everybody is making its moves on the chessboard, hoping that a situation will emerge which is satisfactory to them. But now this new situation has upset the chessboard a little bit. And so everybody has to move their pawns to see how this settles down. So the post-pandemic world is not born yet. These are the pangs of birth of a post-pandemic world. And we are just simply looking at these signals and the indications to see what are the problems which are likely to arise in the future.